So, ready? Yeah? Shall we continue? Good. So, um, we're going to continue to look at the five spiritual uh, faculties. Uh, and we have looked at one definition so far, which uh, is uh, quite interesting and quite unusual. It, the way it defines the Samad Indriya is quite unusual. It's only really found in this place in the suttas. Uh, and uh, so it is qu quite an interesting way that it has just been uh, uh, described there and interpreted in the suttas. Uh. But I want to look at, have a look at another definition of the five faculties uh, as well. Uh, and this is a much more standard kind of definition. And uh, this shows us a little bit about how the suttas sometimes work. Sometimes they can give two different, uh, different definitions, uh, one being more unusual and one being standardized. Uh. And often the standardized definition will maybe be a little bit later, uh, when the Dhamma kind of gets more, uh, everything gets more cross-referenced. And uh, 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 in, th in the early days, things would have been a bit more kind of ad hoc and unusual. Uh, and over time, things get more standardized. This is just the way things seem to work in the world. Uh, and there's, there's no difference really with the Dhamma as such. Uh. So this is the next sutta after the previous one. Uh, and uh, this on page 103, uh, and the uh, sutta is called Should Be Seen. And uh, this is how it goes. <coughs> Mendicants, there are these five faculties. Uh, what five? The faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, uh, stillness, and wisdom. And where should the faculty of faith be seen? In the four factors of stream entry. Uh, where should the faculty of energy be seen? In the four right efforts. Uh, where should the faculty of mindfulness be seen? Uh, in the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas. Uh, and where should the faculty of immersion or stillness be seen? In the four absorption, the four jhanas. Uh, and where should the faculty of wisdom be seen? In the four noble truths. These are the five faculties. Uh, and these are kind of standard definitions you find throughout the suttas. Uh, and here they kind of it has all been standardized, but of course when you standardize things, then sometimes you lose some of the information because the more things are standardized, the, the more everything is kind of spoken of in exactly the same way, and you lose some of the little nuances and little details that are sometimes interesting and important to understand the details of the Dhamma. So this standard definition here is actually in some ways it is less interesting uh, than the previous one, uh, but it also uh, kind of confirms what the previous definition means because it uses more standard vocabulary. So just to give you a rough idea what this means, uh, the four factors of a stream entry, uh, these are uh, the uh, uh, full confidence uh, in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, uh, yeah, the, uh, what they call the unshakable confidence, uh, in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then it is the virtue uh, loved by the noble ones, which is the four of those factors. Uh, and uh, once, you, once you become a stream enter, then you have that full confidence. Uh, and this is what I said before, is that uh, uh, in the previous one, uh, you have the idea that the, uh, the, f uh, the faith is about confidence in the Buddha, the qualities of the Buddha, and here that is expanded out to, to mean the confidence in the triple gem. And that is because the confidence in the triple gem is really uh, implied by confidence in the Buddha. Because when you have the Buddha, you have the Dhamma, when you have the Dhamma, the Sangha, all of these are consequences uh, of the Buddha existing in the world. Uh, so they kind of go together anyway. And here this is just confirmed, just for the sake of that. Uh. And also, interestingly, as I said before, once you are a stream enter, then you, uh, b your virtue becomes uh, confirmed, it become, becomes stable, uh, yeah? And this is why the uh, uh, noble ones, one of the factors of stream entry is that the, uh, your virtue is stable, yeah? You have the Arya Sila, the noble virtue, which is unbroken, it says that unbroken, pure, etc., etc. It's actually a very nice description of, of Sila. I'm not sure if we will come across it this time, but uh, uh, anyway, that, that doesn't matter here. So that is the uh, faculty of faith, yeah? Here it's expanded a little bit. Uh, 
And then you have the faculty of energy, and here it is defined as the four right efforts, in other words, as the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and by doing that, you lose some of that distinction between effort and energy that is, uh, uh, is I think, a prop that you find in the suttas elsewhere. Here. And then the faculty of mindfulness, here it is called the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas, uh, and uh, that confirms that the ability to remember and recall what was said long ago, which was the previous definition, is basically equivalent to mindfulness meditation. Yeah? So these things are basically the same thing. Yeah? Uh, the ability to recall means also present moment awareness and vice versa. These go together. Yeah? Faculty of immersion, four jhanas, uh, as you would expect, the four absorptions. Uh, and uh <coughs> that clarifies what is meant by that slightly obscure uh, as uh, the obscure definition from before, the idea of uh, using <coughs> letting go or using relinquishment or giving up uh, as a basis to attain samadhi. And basically it refers to the four absorptions. And that is what I meant when I said before that when the, I, 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 I'm not sure if I said it even, but when uh, uh, the word samadhi is used uh, by on its own in the suttas, uh, usually it is a reference to the four jhanas. Yeah? When you see the word samadhi, you can assume, unless there is another definition, that it refers to the four jhanas. Why is that? It's be simply because jhanas are by far the most important kind of samadhi in the suttas. Uh, so if the word samadhi is used without further qualification, you can assume that is what it means. Uh, you sometimes you need this kind of little rules to understand what is going on. Uh, and then the last one is the faculty of wisdom. Uh, before it was talked about the arising and passing away, and now this is standardized to the Four Noble Truths, which is the usual way that wisdom is explained in the suttas. Uh. So there you are, there you have two alternative definitions for the five faculties, uh, and uh, that is a pretty complete understanding of what they are about. Now, <coughs> Let us move on to uh, Sutta on page 109. This Sutta is called At the Eastern Gate. And uh, some of the suttas I have included just a little bit out of uh, curiosity because they are kind of interesting and this little sutta is also has one of these little special messages that is very kind of unique to Buddhism in a sense and for this reason it's worth having a look at. So at the Eastern Gate, so I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying in Savati at the Eastern Gate. Then the Buddha said to Venerable Sariputta, Sariputta do you have faith that the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom, when developed and cultivated, uh, uh, culminate, finish and end in the deathless. In other words, do you have confidence, do you have faith that these things end in becoming an arahant? So that's interesting, that's a, that's a kind of strange question. Uh, do you have faith in that? Okay. <laughs> the Buddha asking Venerable Sariputta, so let's see what he says. Sir, in this case, I don't rely on faith in the Buddha's claim that the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness and wisdom, when developed and cultivated, culminate, finish and end in the deathless. There are those who have not known or seen or understood or realized or experienced this with wisdom. They may rely on faith in this matter. But there are those who have, have known, seen, understood, and realized and experienced this with wisdom. They have no doubts or uncertainties in this matter. I have known, seen, understood, realized and experienced this with wisdom. I have no doubts or uncertainties that the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, immersion and wisdom, when developed and cultivated, culminate, finish and end in the deathless. It's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, do you have you got? Do you rely on faith in the Buddha? Not really. <laughs> I just kind of gone beyond that. I gone beyond faith, uh, and this is one of those beautiful little things in the Buddhist teachings that, uh, in the end, we don't actually need 
faith in the Buddha any, anymore. Uh, in the end, we abandon that. And one of the things that it says in the sutta is that you become independent of your teacher. Uh, yeah, you are, and this is one of the fa one of the factors of becoming a stream mentor, uh, is that you are now independent. You are free. You have internalized the Dhamma. You know what it is. Uh, you don't need anyone else to teach you. Uh, so you can sort of, uh, you know, the, the Buddha becomes almost redundant in a sense. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's, that's what basically what it says. Uh. And and this is very different from any other spiritual teachings. Yeah, yeah all, other spiritual teachings. You have to have you have to keep your faith going. Your faith is what really is the saving grace at the end of the day. Uh. In Buddhism, it's the other way around. In Buddhism, it's about getting rid of your disciples. Uh. Yeah. Here the Buddha is getting rid of his disciple. His, this, this disciple has finished his course, okay, now you know, go and do your own thing. Uh, this is what Buddhism is about. Uh. So this is kind of nice, you know, so you... Sometimes you see people disappear, they don't come back to the BGF. Uh, there's two, possi two, two possibilities. Uh, either they become arahants or they have gone astray to some <laughs> something else. <laughs> you never know. <coughs> Anyway, I thought it's nice to point that sutta out because it's kind of a unique Buddhist message. You don't see that kind of message uh, so many other places. So it's kind of nice to s those things that are specific to Buddhism. It's kind of nice to point them out. I think. Yeah. And then the Buddha replies, of course, good, good, Sariputta. There are those who have not known or seen or understood or realized or experienced this with wisdom. They they may rely on faith in this matter. But they are those who have known, seen, understood, realized, and experienced this with wisdom. Uh, they have no doubts or uncertainties uh, that the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, stillness, and wisdom, when developed and cultivated, culminate, finish, and end in the deathless. Uh. Okay, let us go on to the sutta just following this one. This is uh, 4850 at Ar Arpana. And... Uh, the point of this sutta is, uh, there's many points to it, but one of the points is to show you, as I said before, that the five spiritual faculties, they are sequential uh, and they are causal. They start with one and then they cause it, the, uh, the subsequent one, the following one, to, uh, is caused by the previous one all the way to the very end. And this is one of the uh, purposes of this particular sutta. So, uh, thus have so have I, have I heard. <laughs> At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Angas, uh, near the Angan town of Arpana. And Angas, this is uh, close to Magadha, it's east of Magadha, uh, towards kind of Bangladesh in that area. Uh, that's where Angas are. The um, capital of Anga was uh, Champa. It was one of the great cities in India at that time. Then the Buddha said to the venerable Sariputta, Sariputta, would a noble disciple who is sure and devoted to the realized one have any doubts or uncertainty about the realized one or his instruction? Uh, I will just get the, the reason I bought this laptop computer is so I can have the Pali here. It's nice to have the Pali around uh, and we can actually be more certain of what is going on. When you have a translation you can never be absolutely sure what is happening here. So let's uh, Let's have a look, yeah. So the, <coughs> you know, the parley here for uh, Sure and devout, de devoted to a kantagato abhipassana. It means like completely having complete confidence. That's really what it means. So, would a noble disciple who is fully conf confident in the Buddha have any doubt or uncertainty about the realized one or his instruction? Here? And uh, the Venerable Sariputta replies, Sir, a noble disciple who is completely confident in the realized one uh, would have no doubt or uncertainty about the realized one or his instructions. Uh, you can expect that a faithful, noble disciple will live with energy, uh, roused up for giving up unskillful qualities and embracing skillful qualities. Uh, they are strong, staunchly vigorous, not slacking off uh, when it comes to developing skillful qualities. Uh, for their energy 
is a faculty of energy here. So here, when you have faith, uh, you can expect that energy arises as a consequence, uh, and that, that energy is then used to purify your mind further. Uh. And uh, as I said before, it is to be expected because you know what the purpose of life is. Uh, you know where the goal is, you know what this is all about, and you know exactly what you have to do because you've seen all that. So it's natural that you will have the energy uh, to, to uh, uh, guide you in that direction. Uh. You can expect that a faithful, energetic and energetic noble disciple will be mindful uh, with the utmost mindfulness and alertness, uh, able to remember and recall what was said and done long ago. Uh, for their mindfulness is the faculty uh, of mindfulness. Uh, so uh, again, energy uh, leads to mindfulness because uh, that energy is uh, this pretty much the same as the clarity of mind. Uh, these things go are very closely related to each other. Uh, you have faith, you have clarity, you are clear about what needs to be done. Uh, and so this thing is built upon the previous ones. Uh, one thing leading to the next one. Uh. You can expect that the faithful, energetic and mindful noble disciple uh, will, relying on letting go or using relinquishment as a foundation, uh, he will gain a stillness, gain unification of mind, for their stillness uh, or their samadhi is the faculty of stillness. Mindfulness always leads to samadhi. Uh, it is one of those very important things in the suttas. Uh, and uh, uh, in the suttas sometimes, uh, you know, in Buddhist circles we talk about mindfulness leading to wisdom, uh, leading to insight and all of these, these things, but uh, in the suttas the Co the uh, connection between a mindfulness is always it always connected to samadhi on the other side. Uh. The purpose of mindfulness is to lead you to samadhi. So whatever insight you have, or whatever, however you apply that mind in mindfulness, it should always head you towards samadhi, always towards stillness. Uh. It's one of those foundational things in the suttas uh, that you uh, start to see when you read the suttas. You see it again and again and again happening. Uh. It's not very hard to see. Uh. So uh, it, is, it is interesting, because some of these things, they go counter to many of the views that sometimes you may hear in the Buddhist world. Uh, you start to read the word of the Buddha, and you kind of start to gain an independent feeling for what the suttas are like and what the Dhamma is like. This is one of the great benefits of, of reading the Dhamma. You become less dependent on the views of, uh, of everyone else around you, which is quite handy. So this is one of those little things that actually I think is quite important. Uh, um, then, uh, the last one here, you can expect that a faithful, energetic, mindful, noble disciple uh, with, a, um, with a mind immersed in samadhi, uh, who, who has, who, or you can say who has a stilled mind, will understand this. Yeah, so this is the wisdom faculty. Transmig transmigration has no known beginning. No first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. But when that dark mass of ignorance fades away and ceases, with nothing left over, that state is peaceful and sublime. That is, the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, fading away, cessation, extinguishment. For uh, their noble wisdom is the faculty of wisdom. Uh, so here you have an alternative definition of wisdom. Yeah, this is quite interesting. We have just before seen the four noble truths as one uh, one definition. We have seen the uh, arising and passing away, seeing that as another definition. Uh, he would have an entirely different one again. Uh, and uh, so. What, what is going on here? And what is going on is that all of these things are basically just different ways of understanding exactly the same thing. Yeah. It might be hard to, un to see how can this be the same as the Four Noble Truths, uh, but really it is really just the same thing. Yeah. So what does this mean? Uh, transmigration has no known beginning. Yeah, yeah. No first point can be discerned uh, is, is another way of translating this. Uh, yeah, uh, of samsara, no first point can be discerned. This is one of the knowledges you have when you become a stream mentor. How is that possible? What exactly is it that you are seeing? 
And one of the things that you see when you become a stream manager, you see dependent origination. Huh? This is one of the insight you have, insights you have as a stream manager. Huh? And when you see dependent origination, what you see is you see how ignorance always leads to suffering. Huh? How ignorance or lack of seeing or delusion is the root cause that always takes you to ignorance down the track, uh, takes you to suffering uh, further on. Uh. Yeah, this is part of what that is. Uh. And part of the idea of uh, suffering, one of the main ways that suffering is described in the suttas, uh, is precisely rebirth. Uh. So when ignorance takes you to dukkha, uh, it means that it takes you uh, on this round of rebirth, uh, carrying on and on and on into the future. Uh. And the implication of that is that uh, ignorance uh, has no known beginning. Uh. Because the only alternative to ignorance uh, is to be have knowledge. Yeah? But if you had knowledge already, you would have stopped Sangsara a long time ago. So you have to assume that ignorance must go into the past without discoverable beginning. Because if, if it had a beginning, that means at some point in the past you had knowledge, uh, but then you wouldn't be here anymore. Uh, so that's impossible. So ignorance must by must go into the past indefinitely. Uh, no known, known point of ignorance or delusion is possible. Uh. So you can infer that. Yeah, It's not a direct insight because you cannot see these things directly. Uh, even if you remember your past life, so you can only remember back so far. Uh, so this is what we call, when I said earlier today about inferential knowledge, uh, is this as part of that inferential knowledge uh, where it is just obvious that this must be true, but you, even though you haven't actually seen it. Uh, just like the five khandhas, you see that your own five khandhas are impermanent and suffering and non-self, uh, and you infer the same must be true for others. Uh, even though I don't, y you, don't, you don't know other people, you know, it, it, you can infer that because uh, uh, you assume that we're all the same, uh, unless you find some person with six khandhas. Uh, is that possible? <laughs> they, have a, they have a problem, yeah, you can only, you can only deal with five, the sixth one, then you have a problem. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> But so, so this is how inference matters in, in Buddhism. And this is one of these beautiful little things. Transmigration has no known beginning. No beginning can be discerned. Yeah? No first point of sentient beings roaming and transmigrated can be found, hindered by ignorance, uh, fettered by craving. Yeah? So this goes back and back and back and back in time. No first point can be discerned. And this is also a nice way of putting it. Uh, is the Buddha says no first point can be discerned. He doesn't say there is no first point. Uh, he says no first point can be discerned. That it, it, I don't know if that, what that sounds like to you, if it sounds like there is a difference, but actually there is an important difference between those two things. Uh, because if you say that there is no first point, uh, you are making a definite statement about something you cannot really know. Remember, this is inference. Yeah, You know that actually I cannot see any beginning to ignorance here, or you may remember your past lives. You can only go back so far. Uh, but uh, it's an inferential thing, and you cannot really have any absolute knowledge about what happened in the past. Uh, so you say, I cannot see any first point, uh, yeah? but uh, uh, you may not actually have any, uh, but the knowledge uh, that there is no first point uh, is, is actually missing. Uh, so you, uh, uh, so uh, you take it as far as the evidence goes. Uh, Buddhism is like an ev evidence-based teaching, uh, but you don't go beyond the evidence that you have. You remember your past lives, uh, you see so far, uh, so far back, uh, but beyond a certain point, you cannot go any further. Uh, why? Because it's just impossible to remember back for, uh, to infinity. Uh. So, um, uh, and the same thing is true here for this kind of inferential reasoning. Uh, it looks like there is no first point, uh, but you cannot say definitely uh, that it goes on for infinity, uh, because that is beyond the kind of, uh, uh, I think, assumptions uh, or conclusions that you can reach from this statement. Perhaps. Uh, when I look at it now, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you, because uh, it does look like when you make an inference about delusion being the first time, then I wonder whether you can actually say that it goes forever. But that, the Buddha doesn't say that. Uh, all he says, it is not discernible, uh, which is kind of nice, because it's not making an absolute claim about what is going on. Uh. Anyway, that, that's good enough, I think. Yeah. <laughs> So, but um, what is also very interesting about this, which I 
which is very, which always struck me as very powerful. Uh, and this is this idea: there is no first point of sentient beings. These are satta, any kind of being, roaming and transmigrating. Yeah, yeah, roaming and transmigrating, taking part in this samsaric existence going on. Uh, and this word "roam" is really is very powerful word in English language because in English the idea of Rome means that you are not really you have no direction. Uh, roaming is like a random movement, yeah? You're going this way, you're going that way, you're going up, you're going down, you get reborn here, you get reborn there. But it is a movement without purpose, uh, a movement without aim, a movement without a goal. That is the whole point of the word Rome. And this is exactly what you get from these Pali words, sangsarati, to go around, sangdavati. It is that there is no, you're not actually going anywhere particular. So, uh, and this is, uh, I think, very, very useful idea, because uh, one of the reasons why it is so useful, because for most of us it feels like our lives have a kind of meaning. Yeah, It feels like we're doing something useful, we're going towards somewhere, our life always has a goal. Yeah, When you're young you want to grow up, when you come to university you have a goal of having a nice career and a nice family and partner in life and all of these kind of things. Uh, it looks like we have a goal, it looks like we're going somewhere. But the older you get, the more you wonder, were these things real goals after all? Uh, they're like intermediate kind of semi-goals, but then you get there uh, and th then you want to do something more, you want to carry on. Uh, and then you find that actually these things weren't real goals, they weren't real goals, uh, because they, give they didn't give rise uh, to the kind of satisfaction and contentment that you were searching for. Uh, you thought this will make me happy, when in fact it doesn't. Uh, yeah, it is very different from the delusion, what it looks like. The dream is very different from the reality. Uh, and uh, this, so we are roaming around, thinking that we're moving towards a goal. That goal actually never happens. Uh, we never reach that goal. What happens instead is that a new goal arises over the horizon. Uh, I don't know if you have ever done, you know, when you go hiking somewhere. Uh, I used to, when I was a child, I used to go hiking in the mountains in Norway. And there's always, uh, there's always another mountain behind the other one. Uh, yeah, and another one behind that one again. Uh, and it's kind of, it goes on like that forever, uh, yeah? And the one behind looks a little bit higher than the previous one, so you have to climb that one as well, because you want to go to the highest one, yeah? And, it's so, and so on and on it goes, forever, like that. Uh. We went hiking a little bit yesterday, so it reminds me of, of yesterday. It was very nice to, to walk in the little jungle right here in KL. It's really cool that you have this forest right here in KL. It's really nice. But, um, so, and this is, uh, this is life, and it's so important then to Think of samsaric existence uh, as a purposeless wandering around. There is no real goal. There is no finishing point. It is just more of the same. Again and again and again. Uh, yeah, moving around in this purposeless thing. And <coughs> what this does, it gives you a sense of uh, kind of enough of this. Uh, yeah, and if you understand what this really means, uh, it gives you a sense of push away from the entire idea of existence, uh, because actually, it, in the end, it all is quite pointless. Uh. And the reason why it feels, like, feels to us as if we have a purpose in this life is precisely because of the sense of self. Uh, the sense of self creates this purpose in our life, uh, the sense of existence. Uh, we want it to be a purpose because the doer inside of us wants to act uh, and it needs a goal, it needs a purpose. Uh, so we see these purposes uh, and uh, when in fact they are just illusions and not really realities at all. Uh. So you're roaming around. Uh, yeah, We might as well just sit, r stand here and walk randomly around in this room. Uh. Can we, do, we can do that afterwards, we can train on samsara, we can play samsara out on the stage here. Uh. There's random movement around, oh this way, that way. Uh. And we can do that forever after, that would be the same as what we're doing anyway here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it goes against our conditioning, it goes against how we normally view the world. So it's hard to see the world that way. Uh, but um, this is how the Buddha describes it. Um, or in this case, actually, Sariput Venerable Sariputta. So there is no first point of these beings roaming and, and transmigrating, hindered by ignorance uh, and fettered by craving, yeah. hindered by delusion, avidja is the Pali word here, yeah. hindered by il delusion because a delusion means that you are blind, uh. delusion means that you don't see, yeah. you don't know what's going on, uh. that's why you're hindered by it, uh. it's as if we're walking around in the dark, yeah. and when you're walking in the dark you don't know which is the right path, which is the right path, uh, the wrong path and the right path, uh. you don't know where all the 
beams in the ceiling are as you keep knocking your head against beams in the ceiling. That's the dukkha of samsara. Huh? Yeah? And then you wander around in the dark until one day, what happens? One day you feel the wall. There's a switch there. Maybe I should turn on the switch. Click, turn on the switch. You see the path. Now you know what to do. Huh? And turning the switch, that is when delusion stops. Uh, and suddenly you see what is going on. Uh, and this is one of those important metaphors uh, in the suttas. Uh, the metaphor for uh, seeing, for knowledge, for understanding is like the turning on of the light. Uh, yeah? Suddenly there is light. Uh, you've been wandering in darkness before. Suddenly you wake up. Wow! This is what the world is like. Uh, now I can see. Before I was wandering around in darkness. Uh, so this is hindered by ignorance. We literally don't know what is going on. We uh, misunderstand the nature of reality. We see a self where there is, there is no self. We see purpose where there is no purpose. We see <coughs> one important life when in fact there is just an in infinite series, a potential infinite series of lives going on and on and on, one after the other one. Uh, and this is why it is so important to have the Buddha arising in the world. That is why the Buddha is called the Eye of the World, because he sees for each one of us. And then he passes on that information, that knowledge that he has, uh, and it enables us to get started on this path. And this is why the Buddha is so important as a starting point. Uh, that is why the Kalyanamitta is the foundation for the entire practice. Without the Buddha as a Kalyanamitta, we will continue on wandering around in the darkness. Uh, so hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving. The craving is what binds you to the round. Uh, ignorance is what blinds you. Uh, fet uh, craving is what binds you, blinds and binds. Uh, and you are bound because uh, uh, craving always is looking to the future, uh, always driving you on to something else. Uh, and then when you die because the craving is still in your heart, you're still driven against the future, to, towards the future. And because you're driven towards the future, uh, you will get reborn as a consequence. Uh, craving is the binding agent that ties us down to samsaric existence. Uh, and uh, by far the most powerful of these cravings, uh, and the craving that is hardest to let go of, is the sensual craving. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, kind of the one of the uh, uh, biggest problems and one of the things that obviously you have to overcome uh, to enter samadhi. So once you come to samadhi, a lot has been done. A lot of that fetter has already been severed and cut off and now you can, uh, it becomes easier from there on. Uh. So this is uh, this beautiful thing that actually occurs in a number of places in the suttas uh, that kind of makes it clear what this whole thing is about. And it's very closely related to the idea of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, because uh, once you understand the idea of transmigration having no beginning and potentially no end, that is the same thing as understanding Dukkha. Once you understand the connection between craving and uh, and dukkha, which is the insight into dependent origination, which this is part of, uh, then you understand the second and the third noble truths. Uh, yeah, you see all of this. Uh, so this is all all very closely related to each other. Uh, and this third noble truth actually comes up next, but because it says here, but when that dark mass of ignorance fades away and ceases, with nothing left over, then you reach the state of peace, sublime state of peace. Uh, and this is the third noble truth uh, about Nibbana, state that is peaceful and sublime. Uh, that is the Buddha's description of Nibbana. Does, does that sound inspiring? Uh, it doesn't sound all that inspiring. Peaceful and sublime? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I c you know, but when the point is that when the Buddha says peaceful and sublime, he means really, really peaceful and really, really sublime. Uh, so Buddha is always a bit understated here. Uh. <laughs> Etang santang, etang panitang, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, so what is that? And this is the definition of Nibbana that is found in the suttas, yeah? What it is? The stilling of all activities. Uh, yeah, the stilling of all the will, the doing, the striving towards getting things. Uh, when all the sankharas inside, you stop making any kamma, you're not driven towards anything anymore, you still act as an arahant, uh, but you don't act with any purpose because you want to create anything in the world. Uh, now you act purely out of necessity because you have to breathe, you have to eat, and all these kind of things. And sometimes you have to teach, etc. That's what the Buddha uh, does. Uh. So the stilling of all this kamma, 
karma creation, letting go of all attachments, uh, sabupade patanisaga, another one, upade is like almost like ownership, uh, the letting go of everything you own in the world, uh, including the five khandas, everything, bang, letting go of, uh, no holding on. Why? There's nothing worth holding on to. Uh. This is one of those famous little uh, quotes from the suttas that you find around the Buddhist world, inscribed here and there. There's nothing worth holding on to in this world. Uh, um, uh, Sabbedamma nalang abhinivesaya is the is the Pali. All nothing is worth holding on to. Uh, yeah, and this is what you're doing here. And because of that, uh, you let go of everything. Yeah, all attachments, poof, gone. The ending of craving. Yeah, k- things craving. Uh, the fading away. Here meaning the fading away of uh, of uh, craving and cessation, extinguishment, extinguishment of the defilements, the ending of defilements, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. That is what Nibbana is about. Uh, so uh, there you are. And this, of course, is the peaceful and sublime state. Uh, it's interesting how the Buddha describes this, isn't it? Uh, doesn't you know when you read that? You, you, it's kind of you're a bit unsure whether it's good or bad. Is, isn't that right? Uh, the fading or the ending of craving. Okay, sound, this sounds all right. The fading away, extinguishment, stilling of all activities, uh, letting go. Okay, we know that letting go of all attachment is good because we're Buddhists. But so it's it's kind of strange. And this is one of the things about the way the Buddha describes things. The coming from such a high point of view that sometimes when you read it, you wonder: Is it good or bad? Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to sometimes discern. Uh, and this is why it is important to read the Dhamma from so many different points of view, so that you see that this actually is really the way the Buddha describes this. Uh, this is equivalent to the highest kind of happiness. It is sublime, sublime and peaceful. Uh, and uh, this is one of the problems with the Dhamma. Sometimes it comes from such a lofty view uh, that people look at it and think, what? Uh, that sounds completely uninteresting. Uh, it's all about suffering, that kind of stuff. I'd rather go for happiness. But that's the point. It is about happiness. Uh, and this is what you, then we have to kind of get out there. Uh. So, uh, the noble, the noble wisdom is the faculty of wisdom. Uh. And then uh, when the Bosariputta says, uh, when a noble disciple has tried, tried again and again, in other words, has used energy or has, has used effort again and again, uh, has recollected or used mindfulness again and again, has entered immersion again and again, uh, has understood with wisdom again and again, uh, they will be confident thus. Uh, previously, I only heard about these things. Uh, but now I have direct experience of them, uh, and I see them with penetrating wisdom. Uh, for the faith uh, is the faculty of faith. Uh. So here, the faculty of faith is last. In all the previous ones we've seen it first, uh, here he mentions it last, uh, and uh, it shows you that, again, the very close connection in the Buddhist teaching between wisdom and faith. Uh, when you have deep wisdom, when you see things properly, uh, that is when you have the full faith in these teachings. Uh, and when you have the full faith, you have the full wisdom. They are really inseparable. Uh, and this is sort of what comes out of this. Uh, you keep on practicing this until you f- have that deep insight, uh, and only then does both your wisdom and your faith become fully established, uh, everything in one go. Uh. The Buddha replies, good, good, Sariputta. Sariputta, a noble disciple who is sure and devoted to the realized one, would have no doubt or uncertainty about the realized one or his instructions. And then the Buddha repeats everything Venerable Sariputta has said word for word. So there you are. And the, there's a very nice passage there about all the uh, uh, transmigration and all of that. And, and there's all. The, the suttas are so full of information, there's so much in often a small sutta. But uh, the main point of this sutta is just to show you the causality of these things, how they all support each other. Uh, you start off with faith, then you kind of you build it up to wisdom, uh, and then that wisdom somehow takes it back to faith again in the beginning. Everything building each other up, everything being interrelated. Uh, but the main thrust of the causality is starting with uh, uh, faith, and then going through these five factors as a consequence. 
So that is the uh, uh, theory, if you like. Uh, this is how it is uh, uh, described in the suttas. Uh, and uh, what I would like to do now is to have a look at more of an example of how actually this works out, or a few examples how this works out in practice. Uh, so now to do that, uh, I'm going to go back again to one of the... I'm, not, I'm a bit disorganized here, I have to go back and forth all the time. But uh, so that's how it is sometimes, unfortunately. So now if you go back to uh, page 103, and this is the Maha Nama Sutta. And this sutta is from the Anguttara Nikaya, the sixes, number 10, Maha Nama. And this shows the connection uh, between the spiritual faculties. Uh, 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 yeah. And uh, Mahanama, he was a cousin of the Buddha. I don't know if you've heard the story of Mahanama. There's a nice story of Mahanama. You know the story of Mahanama? The story when Mahanama went forth. Uh, yeah, there's a very f it's a story of there's two brothers, Mahanama and Anuruddha. And Anuruddha became one of the great disciples of the Buddha with a divine eye. Yeah, you know, if you know Anuruddha, a very interesting character. And he was doing the, he was famous for doing Satipatthana practice and, and all, of, all of this. And, but when they were young, yeah, they were brothers staying at home uh, and they were really spoiled. Yeah? They came from a very wealthy household. Uh, they were the cousins of the Buddha, of course, because they were the Sakyans. Uh, and the story of them is that soon after the Buddha went forth and became the Buddha, then all the young Sakyans said, well, our country, our cousin, uh, you know, the Buddha, he has a, he, he's become a Buddha. Shouldn't we also go forth? Uh, so many of the young Sakyans, they wanted to go forth and they wanted to practice the spiritual life under the Buddha. And two of those people who were kind of thinking about this, uh, there was uh, uh, Mahanama and Anuruddha. And Mahanama goes to Anuruddha and he says to Anuruddha, he says, uh, uh, you know, y one of us sh should go forth. Would you like to go forth? Uh, and Anuruddha says, no, you know, I, I have been kind of, you know, brought up s with so much luxury. Yeah, I sleep on soft beds. I eat nice foods all the time. I'm not able to live the life gone forth. Yeah, I'm too soft. Uh, yeah, I'm not, not tough enough to live the ascetic life. Uh, so he's being very honest. Yeah, he's kind of being straight to the point. Uh, I've been brought up like a prince, pretty much. Uh, there's no way I can live the ascetic life. Uh, and then Mahanama says, okay, well, that's fine. In that case, you know, I will go for it. But uh, that means you will have to take over all the duties in the household life, yeah? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the, uh, just the, the part of the story also is that, you know, they, you have heard the story about the nutty cakes. You know the story of the nutty cakes? Uh, this is with Anuruddha. The nutty cakes is a story of uh, 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 one day, and Aruda goes to his mother and says, oh, I, I, I would like some cakes. And she, she says, nutty cakes. Nutty cakes means, literally, there are no cakes. But, but Aruda has never heard the word, there are, no. There isn't any. He has never heard that before. Uh, he doesn't know this word. There isn't any. He always gets whatever he wants. Yeah? He was really, really spoiled. Uh, so please don't bring up your children that way, because they... <laughs> They may end up not going forth, just like Anuruddha. So a little bit of hardship is good in life. Uh, so, <laughs> so he nutty cakes. So because he's never heard the words, there aren't any. He thinks nutty is a type of cake. Yeah. So he says when she says nutty cakes, he says yeah, please give yeah nutty cakes. Yeah, let's have some nutty cakes. Uh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> so he misunderstands completely what is going on. Uh, it's one of those sweet little stories. So, so he was really, really spoiled according to the story. Uh, the reality we don't know, but this is the story. And uh, so then Mahanama says to him, well, you have to take over all the household chores then. Yeah, Bec you've been so spoiled. I hope you're able to do that. <laughs> and then I said, well, what are those household chores that we have to do? Well, you have to, you know, when the uh, spring comes, you have to go into the field and you have to kind of plow the field. Uh, after plowing the field, you have to get all the seeds, you have to put the seeds in the ground. Uh, after putting the seeds in the ground, you have to let the water in. Uh, then you have to drain the water out. Uh, then you have to weed the field. Uh, then you have to harvest all the crop. Then you have to thresh the crop. Uh, then you have to, you know, to winnow the, the seeds or whatever. After winnowing the seeds, you have to store it all up. Uh, and Anuruddha starts to sweat well, it's, it's just by the thought of this. He kind of gets a bit concerned. Uh. And then he says, and the next year, uh, you have to do the same thing. Uh. And the next year after that, uh, you have to do s the same thing. Uh. And Anuruddha says, but is there no end in sight? Uh. That's right, there is no end in sight <laughs> of these things. Uh. 
And then Anuruddha said, well, in that case, uh, you stay at home and I will go, I will go for it. <laughs> so always chickening out, yeah? So this is the, the nice story of Mahanama and Anuruddha. Uh, and uh, some of these things are just stories and we can't really, they may not be absolutely true, but sometimes there is a little bit of truth about them. Uh, and uh, I think that's why it is funny because we recognize that there is some truth to how these stories work out. Uh. So this is Mahanama. He remained as a householder. So here is the Buddha in discussion with Mahanama and on how to live the life, in a sense, as a householder. I have to warn you that Mahanama, he was supposed to have been a stream mentor, yeah? so he was a kind of a special, special householder. But the general ideas that I talked about here are applicable to, to anyone. So uh, for that reason, it is still worthwhile uh, looking at this. Uh, so. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans at Kapilavatu in the Banyan Tree Park. So this is cap the capital of the uh, Sakyans, Kapilavatu. Then Mahanama the Sakyan approached the Blessed One, uh, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to the Blessed One, uh, Bhante, how does a noble disciple who has arrived at the fruit and understood the teaching often dwell. This is Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, it's a bit different from Ajahn Sujato. So, anyway, and then the uh, Buddha replies. So first of all, before I go any further, just the idea of arriving at the fruit and understood the teaching. This is a name for a stream enterer, yeah? Agatapallo vinyata sasano. Sasano sasana is the dispensation of the teaching. So one, someone who has understood the teaching, yeah, someone who has the full insight into these things. Uh, so this is how the stream enterer dwells. Uh, and of course, the point is about the reason why the stream enterer dwells like this is because they have seen the truth. Uh, so for them, it is very easy. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it is impossible for other people to practice in this way. Uh, it is quite possible uh, because it's just that it takes more it takes it takes a bit more effort uh, or it takes more contemplation if you like uh, or uh, and it, it's not as reliable as it is for the stream mentor for stream mentor it is reliable they just have to think about this and it kind of gives rise to joy but for people who are not it's a bit more it's not as obvious straightforward uh. so the buddha says uh, here Mahanama, a noble disciple, recollects the Tathagata thus, the Buddha thus. The Blessed One is an Arahant or a perfected one, perfectly awakened, accomplished in true knowledge and conduct, fortunate, knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of tameable people, teacher of devas and humans, the awakened one, the Blessed One. Itipiso, exactly here. Yeah. yeah, that is exactly right. This is the Itipiso, yeah. So there, that is what you see there. And uh, so that is what you do, yeah. And when you do that, uh, what happens? Let me, I'll just continue a little bit so you can get the feeling for why this is being said. Uh, when a noble disciple recollects the Tathagata, the Buddha, on that occasion his mind is not obsessed by greed, ill will, and confusion. Uh, on that occasion, his mind, maybe, not, maybe desire, but desire, ill will, and confusion. Uh, on that occasion, his mind is simply straight, based on the Tathagata. Uh, a noble disciple whose mind is strained gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains joy connected with the Dhamma. And then, of course, from that joy, then the whole process of meditation happens as a consequence. Uh, and this ends up with stillness uh, yeah, it's, uh, at the very end there. Yeah. So this is the point of this. So here it shows the purpose of recollection of the Buddha is to give rise to that joy, which leads to stillness, which leads to samadhi. That is the purpose. Uh, so the purpose of faith, yeah, this is exactly the same thing as the faculty of faith we have been just been looking at, uh, the recollection of these things. Uh, that faculty of faith leads to samadhi, just as with the five faculties. Uh, and here it is uh, described in detail how this actually works, why it turns out this way. Yeah. So what is this recollection of the Buddha? Let us just kind of very briefly mention, I've mentioned this before, but let us have another quick look at this, because there's a very interesting paragraph, and as a, 
this, uh, we just told here that this is the Itti Piso, yeah, and a very common thing that is chanted by Buddhists around the world. And most Buddhists chant this without really understanding the meaning of these words. Uh. So it is far better to understand the meaning, because when you understand the meaning, actually it can be very inspiring. It can really lift you up if you think about it in the right way. Uh. So chanting is nice, but understanding meaning, even better. Uh. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, one of the things that uh, you know we do as Buddhists, we, we do uh, you know some degree of rituals, and I, I always think that doing some rituals is nice, uh, because this is about faith, and rituals can be, sometimes if you do a ritual in a good way, it can actually be very uplifting, and make you feel really good. Uh, we do little rituals like bowing down to the Buddha, and if you bow down to the Buddha in the right way, actually it feels nice. Uh, or if you light some incense or candlesticks, you create an atmosphere and you kind of o offer those to the, you know, to the occasion. Uh, and uh, it's nice to have when you have a shrine for it to be quite nice, so it inspires you. You have a Buddha statue with the right kind of features. Uh, yeah, some people like some Buddha statues, other people, other others. If you get one that is really peaceful and really sublime, peaceful and sublime, as it said here, yeah, which is the Arahant chip. Uh, and then that also is inspiring. Yeah. And then you can do a little bit of chanting or listen to a bit of Buddhist chanting if that inspires you, makes you feel peaceful. Sometimes if you are a Buddhist, and especially people who have grown up in strong Buddhist cultures like Thailand, they have heard Buddhist chanting since they were babies. They were barely born. Actually, before they were born, they probably already heard Buddhist chanting. They were sitting in the mother's tummy and listening to the Buddhist chanting. Uh, yeah, and they have heard this their entire life. And if that is associated with something positive, you know, going to the temple might be peaceful, then just by listening to it you feel peaceful. And of course, then it has a positive effect. So then, so this is kind of the idea with these rituals. We, m we give them meaning, we make them meaningful uh, by making them something which brings peace to you. Uh, and that can be often the starting point for meditation, for example. Yeah? You have a little bit of ritual, you bow down to the Buddha, you light some candles and incense, you listen to a bit of chanting, and maybe better you do some chanting yourself. And then when you feel at ease and nice, then you do some meditation afterwards. Yeah. So uh, using these things in a wise way is, is nice. And I'm a, being a Buddhist monk, you know, we, do, we don't do a lot of rituals at Bodhinana Monastery, but we do a little bit uh, there as well. Uh, every day we do a little bit of rituals, uh, and uh, the idea again is to kind of give rise to some of this uh, inspiration that is part of this. Uh. So this uh, Itti Piso chant uh, is the uh, way that the Buddha suggested we should recall him. The Buddha says, if you're going to recall me, this is what you should be doing. Uh, Itti Piso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho. So this is what he says. So for this, re this reason it is uh, interesting here. Uh, so let us just uh, very briefly have a look at this. And uh, so the idea of the perfectly awakened one. As I mentioned last time, the word awakened gives quite a different feeling from enlightened. Awakened is the fact that you have woken up, you have like you come out of a sleep, you come out of a state of delusion, and now you see clearly what is going on. Uh, accomplished in true knowledge uh, uh, and conduct, uh, uh, and this is the true knowledge here, is uh, uh, the knowledge, uh, true knowledge in Buddhism means uh, three things usually, the past lives, kamma, and also the Four Noble Truths. Uh, uh, but um, uh, true knowledge here, the idea of true knowledge, is very closely also related to understanding what the meaning of life is, uh, where true happiness lies, where suffering lies, uh, how to find those things that are uh, ultimately f uh, fully satisfactory and content. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of um, an important part of this idea of true knowledge. Uh, very closely related with the idea of a uh, knower of the world, which comes afterwards. Uh, the idea of knowing the world uh, uh, means a similar kind of thing. You have an understanding of all the possible happiness and suffering in this world. Uh, and only when you have a full understanding of these things uh, can you make a decision for what you should pursue and what you should not. Uh, only when you have an understanding of what is worthwhile and what is not worthwhile can you make a decision about what to do. Huh? The idea of conduct is that the, Buddha, uh, the Buddha's behavior is very closely related to his uh, insight. Huh? 
when you have deep insight into something, uh, vidya here can be called insight instead of knowledge, uh, then that affects your conduct. Uh, you become a different person. Uh, you become a different person because you are psychologically changed by the fact of becoming a Buddha. When you have destroyed your defilements, uh, you can no longer act from defilements. Uh, you're incapable of being acting from greed or desire. You're incapable of acting from ill will because you haven't got them anymore. They're gone. Uh, so for that reason, a person who is full enlightened should be very pure. Yeah, the conduct should reflect the inner state of mind, as so you can actually see to some extent, you can have some idea of who is enlightened in this world. Uh, so this is the great thing about conduct and vidya, understanding and conduct always coming together. Uh, there are external signs uh, yeah, for someone who, has, uh, who is awakened. Um, uh, so fortunate or what does uh, uh, holy is uh, I think Adan Sudato's translation for Sugato which is one of the epithets of the Buddha he is holy is that a good translation for Sugato uh, it's probably probably satisfactory um, the uh, Sugato literally means one who has gone to a good place or gone to a good destination mm -hmm. Su is good in Pali Gato is gone uh, and uh, so I think one nice translation for Sugato is a uh, the happy, happy one. Uh, yeah, he's happy. He's gone to good destination. Uh, Sugata also means reborn in the good destination, but for the Buddha, obviously, it doesn't mean that. Uh, so he is the ultimate, ultimate happy one. Uh, and uh, he is the unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed or of tameable people. Uh, uh, supreme guide for those who wish to train, according to Adan Sujato. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, and this is kind of the other aspect of the Buddha. Once you have someone who has fully understood the nature of reality, uh, who has seen everything there is about happiness and suffering, uh, yeah, and, and then he can guide you to the highest happiness because he has a full comprehension of that. Uh, he has, as I always like to say, discovered the meaning of life. Uh, he has fully understood the uh, kind of human predicament, what it means, what we desire as humans, uh, because he has seen that fully, uh, and he understands the path that leads to that very meaning. Uh, he becomes the ultimate teacher, uh, yeah, unparalleled teacher. Uh, no, if you, uh, only someone who has that kind of insight uh, is able to give you uh, the full teaching in the way that the Buddha is. Uh. And uh, also, as I I've already said these things already, but I'll say it again. One of the nice things about this, about the Buddha, is that he doesn't have any vested interest. Uh, he doesn't get anything out of being a teacher. Uh, yeah? When the Buddha doesn't get any income, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't really care about people being, you know, worshipping him or respecting him. He doesn't care about that. This is comes from the fact that you have no sense of self anymore. Uh, the Buddha does it out of one reason only, out of compassion. Uh, he sees that he has found the solution to the problems of the world. Uh, he sees that there are beings that are desperately trying to find that same solution. They can't find it. Uh, they are blinded by existence. Uh, so because he has a solution, other people are looking for it. He says, okay, I will give it to you. Here it is. Uh, it's going to be a hassle for me, yeah, but I'll do it anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he has like a negative vested interest. Actually, he doesn't want to teach anyone because he'd rather just kind of, you know, meditate probably. Uh, but he's driven by compassion to help out. Uh, so this is the beauty, it's very beautiful, because uh, with uh, teachers in the world, uh, very often teachers, they have an interest in being teachers. Uh, even if you are just a primary school teacher or whatever it is, uh, you get an income from that, yeah? So you have a vested interest in being the teacher. Uh, or even many spiritual teachers, they have some sort of vested interest. Uh, yeah, maybe they make their living out of that, or maybe they are, are seeking for something uh, uh, by being a teacher. Uh, it, it would be, it's not uncommon if you have a little bit of ego, uh, then very often there will be a little bit of seeking for something there. Uh, and um, so, um, because of this, the Buddha's teaching is very pure and very reliable. Uh, and you know that he, isn't, he doesn't put things in there just to kind of flatter people, flatter the ego, make them feel good or whatever. All of that is taken out uh, because uh, when there's no vested interest, uh, he gives you the teaching in a very pure way. Uh. Whereas other people who have a vested interest, they might flatter your ego to get you to kind of to manipulate you or something like that. Uh, but not the Buddha, he, would, he wouldn't do that. Uh. So for this reason, when you read these teachings, uh, you remember that. Uh, these come from purity, they come from compassion, uh, they come from understanding the very essence of life, uh, what it is, what true happiness and suffering is in the world, uh, what the meaning of life is. Uh, 
That is where they come from. This mixture of compassion and wisdom is very potent and very, very, very powerful once you, once you get that. And so when you read the suttas, uh, you have this feeling of being in the presence of compassion and wisdom. Uh, and then you read them much more carefully. Uh, you take it on board with a sense of more trust. Uh, if you feel that that is true, then you have more trust in these teachings. Uh, it means that you're less likely to reject things uh, in there. Uh, yeah, you come to rebirth, people think, yeah, yeah, rebirth, whatever, don't want don't to hear about that. But you don't think like that anymore because you have a sense of trust. Okay, if the Buddha says there is rebirth, uh, you take it seriously. Huh? Yeah, you don't just reject it out of hand. Uh, and there are some teachings in there that you wonder about. Uh, and of course, we need to be circumspect and careful. We don't just accept everything on board blindly either. There's always that balance. Uh, but what we do, we take it all seriously. Uh, we are careful in our judgment. Uh, we don't come to rash and harsh conclusion, conclusions. Uh, and this is kind of what this is about. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and so this was kind of a part and perp of the purpose of the first part of this uh, whole retreat, it was precisely to give you a feeling for that Buddha as a teacher, as an awakened being and all of that. Uh. So, unsurpassed trainer of a people, of tameable people. Uh, if you are not tameable, then there is no choice, then no, no, nothing can happen, but if you are tameable, then you are part of the deal. Uh. Uh, teacher of gods and humans. Uh. Yeah, the gods also get taught by the Buddha. Uh. Uh, the awakened one, uh, the Blessed One. Uh, that is the Iti Piso um, little passage. Uh, and uh, so please reflect on that uh, because it is actually a very rich and beautiful passage. And as, as I s mentioned before, there's nothing there about supernormal powers, uh, nothing there about strange things. Uh, it is all focused on uh, uh, real things that actually matter in everybody's life. Uh. Okay, so I've been going on for a long time, so let's have a break uh, and maybe meet back again at uh, 10 to 3 or something like that. Uh, yeah, 10 to 3 should be good. Okay. <laughs>